Amen. Let's all pull it in. Continue the great fellowship in the heart, um, but from a seat, stand if you are able. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. You know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. You know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Oh, magnify the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. You know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. You know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Let us praise the Lord of lords. Praise him now and evermore. Praise the Father, Son, and the Spirit. You know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. You know the Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. Amen. Amen. Let's can, uh, continue to sing. If you have your song book, number 202, Hallelujah. We'll sing Hallelujah. <clears throat> Lord, we sing your praises loud. Sing them to the stumbling crowd. Sing of Jesus and his word. Sing until the earth has heard. Hallelujah. Sing of crosses and his blood, earthquake, darkness, and the flood. Sing of judgment, sing of grace, sing until we see his face. Hallelujah. God is why we live and sing. We the servants heed the king. All his power, all his might. Living in the church, his wife. Hallelujah. God is justice, God is love, God is reigning from above, God is sovereign over the land, nation bow at his command, hallelujah, hallelujah. Life is but a passing glance, seek him while you have the chance. We are made of not but clay, till we're changed on that great day in Please be 
be seated. Good morning, everybody. We are AT and Marcy Arneson, and we want to welcome you to our teaching day here in the Chicago Church. Thanks for being here. There's a lot of energy for a Saturday morning. And if you need more energy, there's coffee and sugary things in the back. Uh, we've got a great day planned for us. We're talking about the origin story today. And uh, I want to thank all of those who will be presenting. Uh, we'll properly introduce them before each section today. But people put a lot of work into uh, preparing material to help us better learn God's word this morning. Uh, for those of us who are involved in Thread, and I hope a lot of us are with the Thread podcast, we had our encounter time. Um, you know, when you watch someone on a podcast uh, every week, you start to kind of feel like you know those people, even though they live afar. And, but today, they are a near. And we've got Dave Pachta, Hannah D'Souza, and a behind the scenes Joel Nagel here with us today. And uh, we're really grateful that we uh, in the Chicago Church are engaged as a spiritual community in this kind of learning journey together. Um, you know, the last verse in the Gospel of John, I kind of stumbled across this, and I love this verse, but haven't read it in a long time. John 21, verse 25, it says this, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. That's the closing verse of the Gospel of John. And what that verse tells me is that what I know about Jesus is less than what I do not know about Jesus. And even as a 32-year-old Christian, I find myself enamored at the pursuit of knowing more about Jesus. And today, the theme is the origin story, but in keeping kind of with the pace of, of thread, we're going to be exploring the Torah. And the beginning uh, kind of opening uh, session will be why Torah, and some of you may need this one, what, what Torah, what is Torah, and how is that a foundational key component to us understanding better who Jesus really is. You know, I hope that uh, our hearts are wide open and prepared. Marcy has a few thoughts to kind of make sure they are. Amen. <laughs> wow, okay, that's a lot. That's a <laughs> well, welcome. Welcome to our, our teaching, Congregational Teaching Day, um, where we're exploring, you know, as A.T.'s already mentioned, this, the profound concept of really knowing Christ and his fullness better. Um, it's so great. It's great to see all of you here in person. I also want to welcome those online. It's great to have you with us. And um, it's just encouraging that we've all come together with a shared purpose to mature in Christ and to kind of have the spiritual enrichment that we all want to know Christ better. Um, you know, I love, I was looking back at my notes from the Encounter book. On, on page 22, he talks about um, the difference between amazement and pondering. And I love that today we can do a lot of pondering, which the Bible says Mary did often in her heart. She kind of took the things that were going on around her. She pondered them. What does this mean? Why is this happening? And through a spiritual lens, she was able then to understand the full meaning of the situations around her. And I love that we get to do that today. That today we're going to take the things maybe we ask why about, or maybe we don't quite understand. Maybe we don't understand why you're even here right now. But you know what? I believe with an open heart, God's going to continue to teach us and mature, mature us together in Christ. And I'm just really grateful for each of you taking the time out of your mornings to be here this morning. I know it's a sacrifice, and we're really grateful that we all together want to mature in Christ. So thanks for being here, and being here, and have a great morning. Amen. Come on, Mars. One last thought to kind of put on our minds, and then we're going to pray together, and, uh, and then Clint Lahr, Clint and Christy are going to come on up and do like a, a little kind of icebreaker for us, okay? I don't know what they have prepared, so we'll be the judge of, anyway, but yeah, we'll let that be. Paul has a vision for the church that is attached to us being filled with Christ, and he says in uh, Ephesians 4.13, he says, until we all reach unity in the faith, and in the knowledge of the Son of God, and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. This is what we want to be as the Chicago Church. We want to attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And maybe today, in our couple of hours together, 
there's a little space in you that can be more filled with Jesus. And if that's true, we're going to leave here to give the world something that God wants to give the world through us. So let's pray together. Let's ask God to bless our time as a community and as a family and to bless the speakers that they can move our minds and hearts in a powerful way. Father, thank you so much for this gathering of brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you to those who are watching online. May all of our hearts be knit together today. Father, we want to come together and represent a great fullness of Christ in the world that we live in. Father, we see the effects of darkness and sin in the world around us. We hear sirens even at this very moment, knowing that there's trouble around us that only you can resolve. God, you've resolved so much trouble and reconciliation in our own lives. Father, thank you for redeeming us in the sacrifice of your son. And I pray that today we would pursue knowing Jesus better, that we may attain to that maturity Paul wrote about to the church in Ephesus. Bless every speaker today. Thank you so much for their giftedness and their preparedness to bring your word into our hearts. Let us be a good soil receiving that seed and let it bear fruit in our lives, in our children's lives, in our families' lives, and in our neighborhoods. God, may we be a bright, shining light in the places where you put us so that people will know we are devoted to you, we love you, and we seek to glorify you in all things we do. Bless this day. May there be joy and gratitude in our hearts as we proceed. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. Like A.T. said, we're going to have some rich biblical teaching this morning, but to start things off, to kind of get us ready for all that, we have an icebreaker to, to get the blood flowing a little bit, although don't get too nervous about that. Um, it's not, there, there'll be no meowing this time for those of you who were here for our last teaching day. <laughs> And like A.T. said, hopefully a lot of us have been engaging with the Thread podcast and getting a lot from that. Um, I'll say this, you know, podcasts have exploded in popularity over the last uh, few years, and there's a podcast for just about everything if you go looking for it. And so uh, what we're, the, the game we're going to play today is simply entitled... Is it a podcast? <laughs> and so here's how we play. One, everyone's playing. All right? If you're in the room, you're, you're playing along. Uh, no cell phones. You can't try to look it up and see if it's a podcast. No cheating. We're all disciples here. Amen? But what's going to happen is on the screen, we're going to put up a, a name of what could be a podcast. And then we're going to uh, read a short description of that potential podcast. And then we're going to take a vote. Yes or no, do you think it's a real podcast or is it just made up? And we're going to do it by a raise of hands. And what, we do have prizes for this. So we do have a first place prize, $50 to our corporate overlords, Amazon. They have no affiliation with Chicago Church. I don't mean it like that. I just mean in society in general. Um, and then second place, you get $25 to DoorDash. Um, so, but here's how we're going to determine first and second place. So we're going to vote yes or no if you think it's a real podcast or not. And if you're right, you move on. You get to keep voting. And if you're wrong, you're out. Okay? Now, if you're out, at least you can keep playing in your heart. All right? You can keep... <laughs> When we put the other ones up, you can try to figure out for yourself if you think it's real or not. It just won't count at that point. And so uh, I'm trying to think. That, I, that's the game. It's as simple as that. Are you guys ready to play Is It a Podcast? Here we go. All right. Our first one. Whatever happened to pizza at McDonald's? So this podcast, Whatever Happened to Pizza at McDonald's, it, our host, he's a comedian in the real world, but in the universe of whatever happened to pizza at McDonald's, our host is an investigative journalist who's convinced that the iconic fast food chain used to serve up pizza. 
And he's determined to do everything possible to get to the bottom of why this pizza no longer exists. I'll give you just a, a brief moment here to decide if you think this is a real podcast or not, and then we'll take a vote. Chirp, 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 chirp. Okay, voting time is in. Raise your hand if you think this is a real podcast. And by the way, you can't excuse yourself from a vote. You have to, have to throw your hat into the lot. All right, those are the yays. Put your hands down. The rest of you, let your voice be heard if you do not think this is a podcast. Whatever happened to pizza at McDonald's? Is it a real podcast? The answer, yes, it is a real podcast. Well done. Let me just... This was the thing in my mind that I thought I need to make sure I say this. On the list that we'll have here, the ones that are real podcasts, I have not listened to them. I cannot vouch for their content or appropriateness. Their inclusion on this list does not imply any approval by the Chicago Church of Christ in any shape, form, or fashion. All right, we have the legalities of that out of the way. Christy, we'll do the next one. All right, our next podcast is The Walking Podcast. This podcast is audio of a man going on a walk. He does not speak, and as promised, the words ambient and unusual used to describe the walking podcast are appropriate. What do you think? I'll give you a second. All right. Is this a podcast? Raise your hand if you say yes. To only those who, who are still only, in. Yes, only those that are still in from last round. Okay, you can put your hands down. If you are still in from last round and you think this is not a podcast, please raise your hands. All right, let's find out. This is a podcast. There's a podcast of a guy just going on walks, not saying anything. It's just the audio of what his walk. All right, next one. Unsolved mysteries of the fridge. Dive deep into the unexplained phenomena lurking in your refrigerator. From disappearing leftovers to mysterious odors that defy explanation, our hosts will investigate cold cases and sh share tips for your fridge, to keep your fridge ghost free. I used to love Unsolved Mysteries, the show, as a kid. Here we have it potentially as a podcast, Unsolved Mysteries of the Fridge. Those who are still in, if you think it is a podcast, raise your hands. For those who are still in and don't think it's a podcast, raise your hands. Great. The truth of the matter is, this is not a real podcast. All right, our next podcast. The Subatomic Soap Opera. Tune in to the microscopic drama unfolding within the subatomic particles of everyday life. From electron love triangles to quirk family feuds, each episode offers a glimpse into the quantum soap opera playing out on the smallest scales. All right. For those of you that are still in, who of you thinks this is a podcast? Raise your hand. And for those of you that are still in, who thinks this is not a podcast? Raise your hand. Wow, there's like only four of you. Okay, let's see. Guess what, four of you? You're right. <laughs> it is not a podcast. All right. All right. If you're still in, let's stand up because now we're getting to the, the, the final. If you're still in, if you could stand up. So I think there is only four or five. Mark, three. We only have three left. Four. Four. Great. Okay. All right. Here's our next one. Everything is alive. Everything is Alive is an unscripted interview series chatting with inanimate objects. 
Each episode builds a world filled with life stories from things like a lamppost, a sock, bagpipes, a chainsaw, and more as told in their own words. All right. Oh, the five? Five now? We got five? All right. For those in, if you think this is a real podcast, raise your hand. If you don't, raise your hand. This is a real podcast. I'm sorry. All right, we're narrowing it down. All right, we have four more people left. Okay, the Mundane Meditations podcast. Find inner peace in the most unlikely of places with our host as they guide you through meditations on the mundane. From mindful dishwashing to transcendental toothbrushing, each episode offers a moment of zen in the chaos of everyday life. Yeah, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for the four of you, which of you think this is a podcast? And which of you think this is not a podcast? What was your vote? The, is yes. Okay, so three yes and one no. All right, let's see. This is not a podcast. We have a winner. Come on, come on down. We have $50 to Amazon. Now, way to go, Barb. For our, our, our backup, just so we'll, we'll stay on time here, so the, th the three that were remaining, we'll give it to whoever's birthday is closest to today. How about that? Does that sound all right? Who are the three remaining? If who, the three who just went out? If you, does it, who, who thinks they, does anyone? June. June. Do we have someone closer than June because we're a couple months away? No? September. September. No. June wins our backup. Good job, guys. Well done. There are more. There are more. Just in case. Go for it. All right. A little competition. Little icebreaker. Thanks, Clinton Christie. They keep it interesting. Good job, guys. All right, are we ready to learn from God's Word? We're super grateful to have James Becknell and Phil Lissarski serving as long-standing teachers in the Chicago Church. And uh, today, they're going to tackle our first session, Why Torah? What Torah? Let's give them our full attention. Thanks, brothers. Good morning. I know you all came this morning wondering a question, and I don't think it was why Torah. I, I think the question is, what would happen if we didn't know Batman's origin story? I know, that, I know that's the question you came with this morning. And you, you just ask yourself, what if we didn't have that story? And I like to imagine Batman without the story of him losing his parents in a tragic way. Think about what a different kind of story that would be. Batman would be a very wealthy vigilante who dresses up like a bat and flies around the city defeating bad guys. His parents being at the source of his inspiration makes all the difference in whether or not we really like him or not. Because a, a vigilante dressed up like a bat without a great story is just a really weird rich guy with a lot of time on his hands. <laughs> Our hope for today is that we can dive into and understand our origin story. Now, we all have our individual stories and our family stories, the stories of our tribes and our clans. But we want to dive into and look at what are the stories that define our faith? What are the origin stories of the faith that we hold to? And today we have a very special treat. Our own Phil Lissarski, who is a subject matter expert in the Hebrew Bible, he's going to come up and start us off with a great introduction to what is Torah.
Good morning. Uh, you would say Bokatov. Good morning. Uh, just a, a shout out, really, uh, to, to Hannah and certainly Dave, uh, certainly uh, Joel, how much it's meant for our family, for my wife and I, uh, to, to go through Journey and now into Thread. It's changed our, our spiritual walk. We get to share about things that we're doing concurrently, uh, something that we haven't really done forever. Uh, you have your quiet time, I have my quiet time. But uh, it's really changed our, our life and our dynamic. And so thank you so much for the blessings that it's given us. Uh, what, what is Torah? Let's see if I do this right. Uh, to understand Torah, I think we've got to go to Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, Jesus makes a very profound statement. And he says, the law, or Torah, first five books of the Hebrew Bible, uh, have never gone away. They didn't go away. In fact, he makes quite a statement. We're a little bit pressed for time, so read through that Sermon on the Mount, particularly chapter 5, but I'll kind of recap. And what he says is, for I tell you at the very end of that, that caption or that point, unless your righteousness is far greater than that of the Torah teachers and the Pharisees, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. And that's an incredible statement. You have got to be more righteous than any, uh, go back 2,000 years, any Jewish person that ever lived at the highest level of rabbinical study and, and life lived. And so how do we do that? How, how in the world can we accomplish that? Well, we better understand what the Torah is. The Torah, the written Torah, this is very important, is called the Mikra. And the Mikra is what you read in your Bible. And that's important to understand that there is another Torah and this becomes very important in the Gospels, and it becomes very important in the letters, particularly when Paul is uh, giving an argument that makes your head hurt. And he says, the law is bad, the law is good, the law condemns, the law is this, the law is that. Which law? What Torah? And so it's important to understand that the written Torah is the Mikra. And you've got uh, the Genesis, Bereshit, uh, you've got uh, uh, Exodus, Shmot, you've got Varika, which is Leviticus, Bidmibar, uh, out of the desert, and the Devarim, words. These are just, we think these are interesting titles, and they're just literally the capture of the concept of that particular book. So the Mikra uh, is the written portion, and I just want to briefly let you know that there are interesting and amazing uh, source materials in that written Torah, in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. And we have, we know, different sources that helped put that together. And we simply call them the Yahwist. Uh, we call it the J, you know, Yahweh or Jehovah, J. And then there is the priestly or the P source. And then the Deuteronomist or the D source. And kind of like a fingerprint, you can pretty well tell this is the same writer. And so you have a, a redactor or a writer or a putting together of the scripture that is very much focused on Deuteronomy. And they each have a very important uh, message that they're given. And so the, the Yahwist or the J-Source really wants to talk about man and the soil and the covenant and getting on to the Davidic kingdom and all of those important things. The priestly, obviously, wants to really focus on what does it mean to be a priest? What are the, the requirements at the temple? And you get on to the Deuteronomist, and, and that Deuteronomist writer covers the rest of the story after the Torah. Joshua, Judges, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. And you can tell that that writer is very concerned, led by the Spirit, to get us to a particular point. And that is God's covenant from Torah to the kingdom of David, to the exile, to the return, to Jesus, is all one linear story. It's very powerful. And they use words, they use particularly the way that they do their grammar. All of this, like a fingerprint, you can tell, mm, that's an A.T. Arneson writing. It can't be anything else than that. And so why God did that, led by the Spirit? I think Peter tells us God used men to write his scripture. It's always a partnership between the two, between God and, 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 and man, the prophets and the, later the apostles. Now, hang on, take a deep breath. There's another Torah. It's always been there. And the reason you know it's always been there is Jesus has many intense conversations with the Pharisees and the scribes, and it's really about the oral law. 
And so once it's written down, going way back, probably to the Davidic kingdom, you have people commenting on Torah. It's written, but here's my thoughts on it. And those thoughts accumulated century after century after century of deep rabbinical Jewish wisdom becomes the oral law. So when you read Matthew 23, Jesus will say, it is written, Mikra, but you say, and the you say is getting into the oral Torah. Word says, observe the Shabbat, the Sabbath, keep it holy. But you say that is 100 paces. See the difference? And so the rabbinical wisdom was, if that's what's written, let's protect it. Let's put a hedge around it. And that hedge became the oral tradition. And so Moses, with the written and the oral, comes together later after the destruction of the, of the kingdom into the Mishnah. And the Mishnah is very important because it tells us everything that this oral tradition ever said or thought. And it was put together after the Jewish state was destroyed. And the Jewish people were at a very low point after that. And they came together and they took all of that wisdom and they put it together into a remarkable document called the Mishnah. And as I said before, it was the Jewish war that caused this to happen. And with the destruction of so many of the Jewish people, there was a need to put all of this wisdom into 63 tractates called the Mishnah. And the Mishnah is very important. If you ever really want another commentary on Torah, you can read the Mishnah. It'll, it'll, it'll put you to sleep at times, but it really will give you uh, an understanding of that kind of wisdom. So what is this all about? What, what does it really come down to? And I think what's essential is Romans uh, 7, 7 through 12, and that is Torah serves a purpose. And whether it was going in excess to the oral or the written, we as a faith believe that it is the written Torah, not necessarily the oral, but it's there for a purpose. The Torah has never gone away. It is our diagnosis for sin. We as disciples of, of Jesus are to be more righteous than the Pharisees of Torah. We accomplish this perfection of Torah through, through, through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross and re the receiving of redemption. We are at once freed from the animal sacrifice and the purity duties to concentrate on the higher mitzvahs or parts of the law of love and mercy and, and faithfulness and forgiveness. Does that make sense? So it's never gone away. It sits there. And we're to be almost perfect spiritually. So how do we get there? We get there through Jesus. As we all always knew this, didn't we? But we want to get away that old law. It shouldn't be there, but it's absolutely essential in defining who we are. If you've got a beautiful painting, contrast is everything. Dark, light. A boring painting has no contrast. And as a disciple, our contrast is Torah versus redemption through Christ. It's got to be there. Does that make sense? And so I, I like to kind of wrap things up and say uh, there are traditional divisions that must be fulfilled if you are a Torah studier or a believer, adherence, and that is the moral, the judicial, and the ceremonial. Even the most devout miss the mark. Even Paul says, even though I was righteous, flawless, and yet Paul's kind of hedging his bet there. He says, you know, but I'm also the worst of sinners, right? So he knows. So no matter how much you try on your own effort to make this, you cannot. However, Jesus is, in his sinless life, fulfills all the demands because he walked a perfect law, oral and written. So he is our bridge to perfection. And I, I like to wrap things up by just saying, this is the, the essential for grace, which is Torah. Torah may say, do not physically murder, but I tell you, do not hold hatred in your heart. Torah can say, do not commit physical adultery, but, but yet I say, do not hold impurity in your heart. Prayer of prescribed times, but I say, pray quietly, unseen by your Father. Fast regularly, uh, let, let your fasting be unseen. Uh, give tithes and offerings, give unseen by others abundantly. And finally, be righteous in all the mitzvahs, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So the bridge from Torah 
to where we are as, as redeemed disciples, as Christians, is in fact Christ. And, and without that, without understanding Torah, you can't appreciate, I really do believe, you cannot begin to appreciate our redemptive story. Yeah. Now, we got 10 minutes of, of Phil, or fi about 10 or 15 minutes of Phil, and, and, but, but Phil has so much to offer us on this topic. And if, if you want to take this further, I, I strongly encourage you to reach out to our brother who really is a, a depth of, of love first and of understanding of Torah. So why should we care about the Torah? Now, Phil laid out for us some of the, the, the bits and pieces, the what of Torah, and that it leads us to Jesus. But why should we care about Torah? The, the main reason we should care about the Torah is, and, and Phil alluded to it, it's because Jesus cared about the Torah. And we're going to start in Luke chapter uh, 24 and verse 27. Uh, just going back to my, my, my Batman example, I know the last time that I spoke to you I brought up the Hulk. Uh, so it's like the Hulk and Batman. And No, I'm not that into superheroes, just so you all know. It just happened to be a convenient analogy for, uh, for today. But Luke chapter 24, uh, we're going to start uh, reading here uh, as we look at what Torah is and why we should care about it. You know, on the road to Emmaus, Jesus came alongside two of his students, and there they discussed what had happened in these days, which for them was the devastation of losing their king their Messiah, the one that was going to redeem and rescue Israel. This road was a dark road, a road of contemplation, a road of confusion, a road where darkness seemed to have prevailed over the, the hour. And so as these two disciples are walking down this road and they're struggling with what's to come of their times that they're in, they are distraught. Jesus comes alongside them and walks on the road with them, and he starts to have a conversation with them about the days that are upon them. We don't have time to go through and study the whole story of the Emmaus Road, but certainly it is worth a deeper study and taking some time to really unpack. But I want to just highlight a few of the things that happen on the road to highlight how Jesus takes Torah seriously. In Luke chapter 24 and verse 27, it says here, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And then in verse 32, it says, They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us scriptures and then verse 44 and 45 it says this then he said to them these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures this last uh, two verses are him reuniting with his disciples after the road to Emmaus. Jesus and his early apprentices relied upon Torah as their scripture. So anytime we are looking at the Bible, any, anything from Genesis to Revelation, where we're hearing the, the term scripture being used, we're primarily and essentially dealing with the Torah story. That is their Bible, right? And then you see very clearly here in, this, in these passages, there are these other parts that are being described. I love how Luke puts it in, in verse 27. He began with Moses. Now Moses here is shorthand for the five books of Moses or Torah, what we're covering today. So beginning with Torah and all the prophets... He explained to them and interpreted to them all the scriptures. 
So he uses Torah and prophets as a lens to interpret all the rest of their scriptures, which was in the Hebrew Bible, in our Old Testament. And the focus of what he was interpreting to them was everything that was concerning himself. And so we have here in these verses an explanation of these three parts of the Hebrew Bible. And we refer to them according to the acronym of the Tanakh, the T-N-K. That's the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Kituvim, which is translated as Torah or teachings. Then it's the prophets and then the writings, which are include the Psalms. And we see right here, Jesus is using those three terms to describe the Bible that he and his students are relying upon and using to interpret the times that they're in and to give guidance for life. We're here to talk about the five books of Moses today. And so as we, we look at these, these five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, we have here really a, a whole story of what's, what is promised to Israel. And so I, I broke this up into seasons. Um, I think we're into episodes and seasons and finales and all that type of stuff. I'm sure we all have a favorite show that we're waiting for the final season for. But, you know, the way TV is now, you'll probably have to wait seven or eight years for that. But the first season we're going to talk about today is the season of Yahweh and his new world. In Genesis chapter 1 through 11, this teaches us about the central conflict of the entire Bible. God is phenomenally good, and human beings are very efficient at messing things up. Genesis chapter 1, we, we see here, God creates a beautiful world out of the waters of chaos and darkness. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and I'll read 2 as well. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And so we see here God beginning his new work in the world by creating the world and forming his earth forming his universe, making something beautiful. If you just stop and take a deep breath and take a little walk through your neighborhood, you don't have to live in the most lush and, and forested area to just get some appreciation for how beautiful and good the world that God created is. Think about what it means to just step out on your porch, step out in your yard, and just to look up and take in a deep breath of that beautiful oxygen that God has blessed you with. Just that one thing. I dare you to do it at night, to just go out and look up, if it's a clear night, to see the stars and to remember that you're a part of the whole of God's creation. And so God creates this world. But he's not done because he includes human beings in his creation. And I'm just going to highlight a couple of verses here in this uh, section. Genesis chapter 1, in verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, after our likeness. And then in verse 27, it says, God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. And so we have this beginnings of God's new world, the creation of his beauty and his opulence, and then he puts humankind here. And he tells them, I want you to go crazy and have a lot of babies. <laughs> right? And, and that's what we did. Right? And so we have the beginnings of a beautiful world, of, of beautiful and wonderful people. And then in Genesis chapter 3, God's image bearers are given everything in the Garden of Eden, right? They have everything they need for 
the most unbelievable life. They have really fundamentally life without end. And they have everything that they need. And they've also been called to co-create with God, to be co-heirs with God, to populate the world and to build the world for good. But not too long after this, they decide that they would rather be on par with God and they seize control and try to replace him as rulers of themselves. That's really what happens when the pair, Adam and Eve, Eve reached out for the fruit and they share that fruit. They're, saying, they're seizing control for themselves and wanting to rule themselves and to have the same kind of knowledge that God does. Now, how does that go for them? Well, it doesn't go too good. And so, as we think about what happened to this pair after this, we see in Genesis 4 through 11 a downward spiral take place. It's the downward spiral of this new human experience. And in this downward spiral, we have Cain and Abel, right? We, Cain and Abel have this rivalry over what they produce, and Cain destroys his brother. And then Lamech comes on the scene, and he's a part of a family that begins industry and art, and he claims to be even fiercer and tougher and badder than Cain. Then Noah comes on the scene in Genesis 6 through 10, and his sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, are born. Noah seems like a pretty righteous individual. He, He actually has quite an unbelievable story of faith and confidence in God, but... As he joins the downward spiral of humanity, what is the first thing he does does after he escapes the flood? Well, he grows a vineyard because he's a man of the soil, and he gets totally plastered and wasted on the wine that he produced from that vineyard. I mean, I don't know if I totally blame him. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to, I'm not judging Noah. I'm not here to judge anybody, okay? But you think about what happens here. He grows his vineyard. He, he gets wasted. And then some really highly inappropriate stuff happens in his family. We're not exactly sure what happened there, but, but there's some really, really un- inappropriate stuff happens that continues the downward spiral of his family. And then the Tower of Babel comes in Genesis chapter 11. Humans have reached a place where they are back at this job this idea of trying to seize control they want to build a tower so that they can be equal with god so that they can reach the heavens they have a unified language and they are going to seize control of the world and god intervenes and causes confusion in their languages and you might think of this not as an act of discipline but an act of grace really to save us from ourselves does anybody relate to these people the next season is Yahweh and Abraham's family in Genesis 12 through 50 Yahweh's mission is to save his creation through his covenant story with Israel in Genesis chapter 12 we see the blessing to the nations that Abraham and his family are supposed to be And so, let's read Genesis 12, 1 through 3 here. In Genesis 12, verse 1, it says this, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Thank you, God, for this promise. Because that's why we are sitting here today. Right? Abraham is all of our fathers. You can call Abraham daddy if you want to. Thank you, Abraham, for existing and for really being the progenitor of this family and getting things going. But... (laughs) Abraham and his family are also a part of this downward spiral that's continuing to take place. 
right? We have Lot, and we have Sarai, and we have Hagar and Ishmael. We have Lot's daughters, and then we have Jacob and Esau and, and Laban. You know, we know the stories of all these people, both wonderful and terrible, right? So what, what is the story being told to all of us in the humanity that we see here in Scripture? That humans, i.e. you, are both wonderful and terrible, right? So do not be shocked when you are looking in the mirror wondering, why am I like this? Okay, it's okay. It's okay. God is in the business of giving us hope. And that is what he's doing through Abraham's line. Because even in spite of all of these things taking place, what's happening is that there is still hope. There's still an opportunity for God to work even with these very, very messy people and in this messy family. And God says, bless it. Bless it. I say we bless it because we all know what it's like to have to deal with the mess of being humans. And then Genesis chapter 50 wraps up this section very powerfully. It says in Genesis 50, verse 19, But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I am I in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. You know, this could be a tagline for God's mission in the world to this day, right? No matter what we are going through, no matter what challenges we're facing, no matter what issues we might have to circumvent or overcome or, or get through, even if we are facing down treacherous evil, which I believe in our lifetime we will all have to face, we will have to face that treacherous evil from the outside, but then we'll also have to face that, that treacherousness that comes up from within us as well. And God says, don't be disheartened. Because in, even in spite of that, many people will be kept alive to this day by their hope in God and the promise that's being delivered through Abraham's family. Amen? God is good at constantly working with us in every circumstance, even when we're caught up doing terrible stuff. Season number three is the story of the deliverer and of the exodus. Now, exodus in and of itself, this, this story, this part of God's story, it deserves its own day. It deserves its own week. It deserves its own month. It deserves everything we can devote to understanding this story. And I, don't, I can't overemphasize the, the vital importance of this part of God's story. And here's, here's why. We have the Torah, right? We have Genesis. Everything after Genesis is about the Exodus. The rest of the Torah is about the Exodus. And so the Torah is about the Exodus. Many scholars even would say that, that Genesis is like a prelude or a prequel to tell the origin stories of the people of Israel so that they can tell the story of the, of the Exodus. And so the centrality of this, uh, this is essential to know. You know, Yahweh keeps his promise to Abraham by redeeming Israel from slavery in Egypt. Egypt and Pharaoh represent really the archetypal evil. Pharaoh is so, such a bad guy, he doesn't even get a name in the Bible, right? He's just Pharaoh. And, man, he is, he is on one. He is on a terror to destroy and to just completely annihilate or use or abuse God's people. Israel's redemption, in, starting in uh, Exodus 6, takes place through God. Now, we look at the Exodus story, and there's a lot of big figures in the, in the Exodus story. Pharaoh and Moses and all the other hosts of folks that are in this story. But the story, the main character in the Exodus story is who? It's God. The story of Exodus is about Yahweh and his ability to deliver the goods on the promises he made to his people. Amen. God is the main character in the Exodus. Exodus chapter 6 
and we'll, uh, we'll look here at Exodus 6, verse 6. It says, Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. And so God says, I'm setting this whole terrible situation up for my glory. You are going to see me show up for you like you would never have believed. Divine justice on Pharaoh and Egypt will be delivered. And so we see here in this, in this story of the Exodus, we have the reception of the Passover lamb in Exodus 12 and 13. And this has, leads us all the way up to the gospel. We have the passing through the waters in Exodus 14 and 15. And then on the other side of, of the sea, when they escape Pharaoh and they get through to the other side, in Exodus 15, we have the song of the sea, the song of Miriam and Moses. And here is just a note to add to this we won't, won't have time to get into, and that is the, the book of Psalms. And as a matter of fact, not just the book of Psalms, but all of the Psalms that are all throughout the Bible. The Bible is made up of about one-third poetry. Go and look at the prophets. It's full of poetry. You go and look at, obviously, the book of Psalms, but then sprinkled all throughout the rest of Scripture, you see song after song after song being prayed out to God. And that's why when you leave church on Sunday morning, you're not going to hum the sermon. You're going to remember the songs that you sang. And that's why psalms and singing is so essential and so central to what we do in our worship. So we have, on the other side of the sea, not too long after they get through, Israel grumbles. Oh, they're still a part of that downward spiral, right? And, but yet, God still prevails. Season four is Israel, Torah, and Sinai. And so here we have Exodus 16 through Numbers 36. This is where, for most of us, we stop reading Torah. We get through this, we, we hear this beautiful song, and we get to the other side of the sea, and we're like, man, what a great story that was. And then we just go, what's happening right now? We just get lost. We get lost because here is where really the teaching, the guidance the very deliberate and specific guidance that God has planned for his people is being laid out. And this is Yahweh calling Israel into a covenant relationship with him on behalf of the whole world. They are going to become, through their obedience to Torah and to the, the laws or the guidance that he provides them, they're going to be a light to the nations. And that really is the heart of these laws. They're not, they're not laws if you break them, you get a ticket. They're not laws if you, if you, you, know, you go to jail, you know, whatever. This, these are not those kind of laws. Really what they are, all, the, 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 a really solid word to describe them is, is guidance. It's guidance, right? And if you really break them down and look at them, it's, it's a life-giving book of laws that allows for Israel to really truly be set apart and be something very, very special in the world. In Leviticus 19, 1 and 2, we see the spirit of this. And it says here, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy, set apart, special, we are a part of these set-apart holy people. This continues all the way through to the New Testament. Israel is consistently disobedient and doing terrible, a terrible job at keeping Torah. But right after they agree to the covenant in, in Exodus at the, mount, at the foot of Mount Sinai, here comes the golden calf. Here comes out here, you know what? We, we need some other God to worship. Moses has left us here. We got to do something. And so... Right away, we see the downward spiral continue. Unfortunately, it's still real. And there's this cycle that happens in this part of the Torah story in this season. It's law is given, rebellion takes place, grumbling happens, 
And then at times, sometimes there's discipline, but, but this is cycle of law, rebellion, and grumbling that's taking place. And these laws keep increasing. You know, it's law, narrative, story about messing it up somehow, and then more law. And so we end up with, you know, according to uh, the majority of, of, of Jewish scholars and thinkers, there, is, there are 613 laws in Torah. And you know, there's some debate about the exact number, but, but we have 613 laws that were, were handed in Torah. And is the point that these laws will just keep increasing and increasing and increasing? No. It's not, it, it's not about the, the numbers of laws or the increasing of the laws. Really, this is about Israel's sin that's clashing with Yahweh's holiness, and it's seeking a resolve by sacrifice. But even Moses, at the end of his time, is not able to enter the presence of God. Right In Exodus 40, we see there that all this build up to this, this, this tabernacle being built and, and there being a place to go and see God, and, and then Moses himself is, is shut out in a sense, or isn't able to enter. But it leaves us with a cliffhanger to consider the future where is this going? And why does this matter? Why is the question we're trying to answer today. And that leads us to Deuteronomy. And Moses is thought to be Moses' final speech. He knows that Israel... Now, by this time, you have to know, Moses has every confidence in the world that the people that he is leading are going to blow it. I mean, think about what else... I mean, if you've been with these people for 40 years wandering through the desert, and you've watched everything they've done up to this point, what do you think they're going to do next? What is the likelihood? What are the probabilities that they're going to end up doing something really off? It's very high. And Moses knows this, and he, he alludes to this. He calls them to obey in Deuteronomy 8, but he knows that they're not going to be able to do it. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Moses knows that only, only Yahweh, only God is going to be able to heal Israel's sinful heart. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Let's go there. Deuteronomy 30 verse 1, it says this. And when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you today, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, and you and your children, uh, and you and your children, and obey his voice in all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all of your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord, your God, has scattered you. And we see here, Moses basically saying, I know you're going to blow it. I know you're going to get scattered. I know this is going to go horrible. But God is still here with you. And he's still, you can still hold to his promises, and you will be delivered. You know, Torah foresees a number of things. A coming Messiah who will vanquish evil in Genesis 3. A fulfillment of God's promise to bless all the nations through Abraham in Genesis 12 and 22. That one will come from Judah to rule over the nations, Genesis 49. One will emerge who is a prophet like Moses, Deuteronomy 18. And he will do signs and wonders and rescue the people of Israel. Could it be Jesus? I say these people writing these words believed that someone would come with these qualities that will, will come to really be the linchpin in the story for the people of Israel. And I believe it to be Jesus. In terms of the ultimate fulfillment, these words in, in, uh, that I've read throughout the story of, of Torah, these words took on a messianic connotation. And you see as the gospel writers read and interpret Torah, that's how they read it. So as Jesus exposed in his teachings from the scriptures and his early followers picked up on it and continued to teach as he did, the Torah, in essence, the whole of the Old Testament, is directing us, where? To Jesus. 
This whole story, why are we doing this? Why are we focused on this? Because this whole story is directing us to Jesus, the center and source for all life. And as we conclude, I just want us to consider this. As we sit back and we try to study all this stuff out and learn it, know it, understand it, discern it, we have to remember that Jesus is the one that will provide us with the ability to understand it. In verse 45 of Luke 24, it says, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And I pray that we pray that Jesus would open our minds so that we can understand Torah. Amen? Amen. If you want a, a longer version of this, or I, I have a, a class recorded. You can use the QR code here to go to that class. It's, it's a, I, I let myself go a little bit on that one and just went for it. And so if you want to continue this study, you can use this QR code. It will be on our Vimeo page on the Chicago Church of Christ, so you can go there. You know, we, we had this idea of, we started off with Batman, which, you know, with this weird rich vigilante without a backstory. But because he has an origin story, what, like, who, who doesn't love Batman? You know what I'm saying? Like, Batman is like the quintessential hero. He, he didn't come from another planet. You know what? He didn't get bit by a spider. He's just like a regular human being with it's super rich and has access to, like, unbelievable technology. So that's the difference between you and Batman, right? The Torah, the origin story of the people of Israel, is the origin story of Jesus and his students all the way up to this day. It is our story as well. We are acting out the final season of the story together. This origin story is God's, and he has generously grafted us into his story. Amen. Wow. Um, I'm so grateful. I, you know, I love the passage that James uh, read in the beginning, Luke 24, where our heart's not burning within us. And I think when Phil got up and said, what is Torah? He spoke for about 11 minutes and I was like, that, that's like a tiny little sliver of Phil's knowledge on what is Torah. Anybody that knows Phil knows this is his passion. And I know there's more there to be gained, but I just, I'm so grateful that James came up and kind of walked us through the Torah story. And there's a lot more to come. We're going to take a break. Uh, uh, James and Phil will be up here if you want to approach them and ask them any questions. And then we'll be back for round two at 11.15. So go get coffee, fellowship. We're on a break. Thanks, guys.
that's right.
Amen. Let's uh, grab the coffee and head back to our seats for the, another section of this great morning. Jordan River, I'm bound to cross. Jordan River, I'm bound to cross. Jordan River, I'm bound to cross. I've got one more river. I've got one more river. I've got one more river to cross. My sister, she'll be awaiting there, but she can help me across. My sister, she'll be awaiting there, but she can help me across. My sister, she'll be awaiting there. She can help me across. I've got one more river. I've got one more. I've got one more river to cross. My brother, he'll be awaiting there, but he can help me across. My brother, he'll be awaiting there, but he can help me across. My brother, he'll be awaiting there. He can help me across. I've got one more river. I've got one more river. I've got one more river to cross. My Jesus, he'll be awaiting there, and he will help me across. My Jesus, he'll be awaiting there, and he will help me across. My Jesus, he'll be awaiting there, and he will help me across. I've got no more river. I've got no more rivers. I've got no more rivers to cross. Jordan River, I'm bound to cross. Jordan River, I'm bound to cross. Jordan River, Please be seated. All right, you guys ready for round two? Is the coffee still flowing back there? Okay, so uh, we are gonna go uh, from the average age of our teachers being 60 to the average age of our teachers being 33. Um, and I think that's a good thing. We're a multi-generational church. And we want to hear from the maturity of those who have been around forever, and we want to hear from the wisdom and maturity of those who are of the generation that will carry uh, the work of God in Chicago and beyond uh, further ahead in the, in the years to come. We have a celebrity amongst us with Hannah D'Souza. She hates that introduction, but Hannah's here. She will be presenting, uh, Tanner and, and, and Hannah are going, uh, going to be presenting kind of the story of God under the title of Time to Time as it's presented in the Torah. Uh, the cool thing about both Hannah and Tanner is they're kingdom kids. Uh, they, were, they were both raised in the church. It's really awesome that they were raised in the church. Their parents are disciples. Hannah's dad was the fourth person baptized in the planting in London way back in the day. I think that would have been the early 80s, 1980s or something like that when a lot of us had really big hair and mullets going on, okay? So anyway, let's give our attention to the younger among us, but the very wise among us as they teach us more about Torah. Here we go. Uh, it's good to see you guys. Thanks for being here this morning. Um, I am deeply excited for you guys to get to know Hannah and Joel today. I've had the pleasure of working with them for the past number of months, and you all see them on the screen and hear them and read what they write, and so I'm really excited that as a church we're taking the opportunity to not only learn Torah, but learn more about our brothers and sisters and this relationship that we have right here. I think it's really cool. Um, if I were to ask you what Joe Cocker, 
Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, and the band all have in common, um, nobody remembered that they played on the last day of Woodstock because Jimi Hendrix played after them. That's what they all have in common. So whatever I say in the next few minutes, maybe you'll take notes and remember it later because I know you're really excited to hear from Hannah in just a few minutes here. Um, we're going to talk about stories, and stories specifically, they help us to know God. They help us to help others know about God. And the Torah is an example of that as a whole. It's also an example of that with a couple of brilliant stories in there. And so we, we kind of racked our brains for a while thinking, is, is there a small story we can dive into that, that pulls on some of these larger themes that Phil and James talked about this morning? And I think Hannah and I are both very passionate about knowing who he is that we are worshiping. I'm learning that while God doesn't change, there's so much more to him that at times it, it feels almost like a different God that I'm seeing. When in reality, I'm just limited with my perspective. I can't grasp all of him in one view. And so he isn't changing. I'm just seeing my limitations and understanding how grand he is. And that's why we need stories. That's why the Torah was so important. God promises that he is both knowable and incomprehensible. And if you think about that, it's a, it's a paradox. Our Western minds associate knowing with defining that we can identify something, we know its limits, we know its boundaries, we can label it, and now we feel like we've mastered it. That, however, is not how the Hebrew mind made sense of the world. The ancient world communicated understanding through stories and relational experiences and discoveries. And so when you hear a story, the whole point of the story is you don't know the end until the end. It gets revealed over time. And there's an unveiling that happens across pages of stories over time. We meet characters one page at a time. And so the way that we know God is ongoing. We can have a comprehensive grasp on all that God has presented to us and still not know all of who God is. And if you believe that for us, you certainly have to believe that about the Israelites as they are experiencing God for the first time. In real time, they are getting to meet Yahweh. This is their first shot at monotheism. This is their first shot at all these things are happening. At the point of the story that we're going to get to here, I mean, in the, at the beginning of the Exodus story, they don't have the law. They don't have a temple. They don't have all of these images that people would associate with worship and understanding a God. And so we're going to start with this story. We're going to be in Exodus 32. In just a moment, I'm going to give you some context for that. Starting in Exodus 24, in verse 13, it says, Moses set out with Joshua his aide, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. He said to the elders, wait here for us until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur are with you, and anyone involved in a dispute can go to them. So when Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it. And on the seventh day, the Lord called Moses from within the cloud. The Israelites, the glory of the Lord, to the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And then during this time on the mountain, we're getting all this detail about the tabernacle, about the priesthood, about the altar, about all these things that the people are honestly really desiring to know. How do we approach this God that we are getting to know? And God is beginning to lay that out for Moses. And then if you know tragically what happens, that's where we are in Exodus chapter 32, starting in verse 1. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods. This, this word Elohim, it's used 2,600 times or so in the Old Testament. It's, it's plural, but it's, it's really singular in a lot of ways. Your translation might say gods. It, Phil can tell you all the deep Hebrew stuff about that, but there's really, there's a richness to it being the sovereign God of creation. It is really singular and kingly in its rule. And so come make us this God who will go before us. 
That's some Exodus language right there, isn't it? Going before us. As for this fellow Moses, which I always love, they pretend like they don't care about him so much in that moment, (laughs) who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters were wearing and bring them to me, which this is actually the plunder that they took from Egypt that God set up for them to have in Exodus chapter 12. And so he took what they handed him, and your NIV says, and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. You could also read this as, he took what handed them, and he designed it with a rush pin and made it into a cast metal calf. Now, for a nerd alert out there, anyone who wants, I can send you about a 20-page article about the translation of this tool. And everyone's thoughts about, is this like a lost wax casting? Or what's the process by which they forged this tool? And there's a lot of confusion. Did they write on it after? That wouldn't make sense. Did they write on it before? And anyways, all that's to say about this is it was incredibly deliberate, the process that went through. This detail that the author puts in here shows the deliberate nature of what Aaron and the Israelites are doing. Then he said, these are your gods who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, tomorrow there will be a festival to Yahweh. But there's the calf. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterwards they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I have commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Divine blueprints appear all throughout the Hebrew Bible. They can be seen in situations like Noah's Ark, the bronze serpent, the temple design, and First Chronicles. And ironically, The tabernacle and all the furnishings of it, which is what kept Moses up on the mountain, was also a divine blueprint. And so while Moses was receiving this divine blueprint on the top of the mountain, Aaron was at the bottom of the mountain designing something that would be an abomination to God. Archaeological evidence from this area suggests that the normal process of shaping these types of figures was long and detailed and contained multiple two-dimensional blueprints in ink sketches, drafting details, meaning that Aaron wasn't freestyling this with Patrick Swayze's God's hands coming around the side for him. You know what I mean? It was, it was deliberate. It was designed. And design always implies intent. And although Aaron lied about its miraculous leaping from the foundry, the writer of Exodus undercuts that narrative and adds details to show us how sinister the idolatry is. Their emotions and anxieties shifted quickly, but their response was thought through. The craftsmanship took time, and there were many opportunities to forego the forging. The bull was very familiar in some circles of Egyptian worship. Cult worship at Memphis and Heopolis were a few of the famous examples. But it's actually debatable about whether or not the Israelites would have experienced those geographic regions of Egypt. And even if they did, it's inconceivable that Aaron would have so quickly attributed an Egyptian god when he just saw his god trump those Egyptian gods. They were lesser. It's also worth noting that the Egyptians didn't worship images of bulls, but actually living bulls. And so in searching for the context of this idol, you don't have to limit the search to Egypt because the bull was widely symbolized for fertility and combat all throughout the ancient Near East. The impending migration out of Sinai would have stirred some sort of desires for combative strength or the desire for a multiplying nation that would make a name for itself. And so there are many potential reference points for what this false image would have been. The confusion for us as readers I believe is also mirrored by the confusion of the Israelites. Did they know who they were actually worshiping? There's a presence of a cattle god that has nothing to do with Yahweh, yet there is a festival that is named after Yahweh. 
There are proper sacrifices and offerings, and then there are ritualistic pagan orgies that are the opposite of Yahweh's covenant in nature. And so renowned Jewish scholar and professor, Nahum Sarna, said, It is all but certain that in demanding a god, they intended nothing more than an appropriate object emblematic of the divine presence. That's why Aaron could declare in all sincerity after making the image that the next day would be a festival of the Lord. He used Yahweh, the YHWH, the solemn, distinctive Israelite name of God. There is no rejection of the national God. So Sarna would go on to say that the most attractive suggestion about this made by Aaron was that um, it was not at all intended to represent the deity, but to function as the pedestal of the invisible God of Israel. Here again, we can adduce a number of examples from the art of the ancient Near East wherein gods stand upon animals, mostly bulls and lions. The pedestal elevates the god above the human level, and the particular animal might be suggested of the god's attributes. So what he's saying is it's kind of like a zodiac sign mixed with a parade float, right? That Aaron was building something, and this wasn't God, but this would be something that, that might deliver God or might house God or might be a pedestal for God in some sort of way. Aaron likely modeled this convention. And since Yahweh was not to be made into an image, his presence seated atop the calf would be left to our imagination. So if you're tracking with what's being discussed on the top of the mountain at the same point, you'll recognize that there are mirror events of these two blueprints. In Exodus 25, Yahweh describes his meeting place above the ark between the outstretched wings of the two golden cherubim. The difference is that the cherubim were not within the public eye. They did not represent known reference points, and most importantly, the cherubim were expressly communicated and detailed by God. Scholar Elizabeth Van Dyke says that the problem was not just that the high priest acted without divine endorsement. The problem was that the priest designed the image instead of Yahweh. He usurped a uniquely divine prerogative in the ancient world. There's a pride and a humanism and a reactivity in this story that, in my mind, mirrors Babel. Let's build something for the glory of God, but couched in all sorts of human and personal benefits at the same time. The situation in the wilderness produced two different contradictory and mutually exclusive responses. The one illegitimate and distortive, the golden calf. The other, legitimate and corrective, the tabernacle. This explains why the story of the golden calf intersects the tabernacle theme. So who were they actually worshiping? What is God like? This is a major theme for the people of Israel during the course of history that we have recorded in the Torah. It's important for us to acknowledge that they don't know what we now know. We don't even know what we don't know. (laughs) Scripture didn't fall from the sky in its completed form. They were learning about God in real time as he was disclosing and revealing himself to them. That shows us that Yahweh is relational. He could have written the textbook. He could have made a QR code for us told us the date of the big exam. Instead, he chose to be with his people and reveal himself over time. And that would create all sorts of necessary messes, like laws and priesthood and holiness and all sorts of other things that might have been avoided had he chose another way. But he's relational, and that was the route he chose to engage with us. So, what is God like? My friends will make fun of me. I'm going to quote A.W. Tozer for a minute here. (laughs) Said at the outset, I must acknowledge that it cannot be answered except to say that God is not like anything. That is, he is not exactly like anything or anybody. We learn by using what we already know as a bridge over which we pass to the unknown. It is not possible for the mind to crash suddenly past the familiar into the totally unfamiliar. Even the most vigorous and daring man is unable to create something out of nothing by a spontaneous act of imagination. 
Those strange beings that populate the world of mythology and superstition are not pure creations of fancy. The imagination created them by taking the ordinary inhabitants of the earth and air and sea and extending their familiar form beyond their normal boundaries. However beautiful or grotesque they may be, their prototypes can always be identified. They are like something we already know. When the Spirit would acquaint us with something that lies beyond the field of our knowledge, he tells us that this thing is like something we already know, but he's always careful to phrase his description so as to save us from slavish literalism. We see an example of this with the prophetic vision of Ezekiel. In his description of the vision, Ezekiel resorts to three degrees of simile in comparison. He said is the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. What he was seeing was so utterly indescribable that without the fallback of common language and comparative reference points, it could not begin to be understood or communicated. Our knowledge of God is incomplete. Not necessarily inadequate, but incomplete. There's a tension there. The very nature of being creation puts us in a posture of patience. We wait as God reveals himself. As humans, the height of creation, we're made in the image of God. We still have limitations in our ability to witness and comprehend God. Paul references this in 1 Corinthians 13 where he says, For now we see only as a reflection, but one day we will see face to face. Tozer continues. He says, when we try to imagine what God is like, we must of necessity use that which is not God as the raw material for our minds to work on. Hence, whatever we visualize God to be, he is not. For we have constructed our image out of that which he has made, of which he has made is not God. Left to ourselves, we tend immediately to reduce God to manageable terms. We want to get him where we can use him or at least know where he is when we need him. We want a God we can in some measure control. We need the feeling of security that comes from knowing what God is like, and what he is like is, of course, the composite of all the religious pictures we have seen and all the best people we have known or heard about and all the sublime ideas we have entertained. We seek a watertight apologetic that could convert every heathen and atheist on the face of the earth. If only we could distill all the depths of God into a few analogies like two wings of an airplane or water being solid, liquid, and gas. That was supposed to be a joke. Because it doesn't work. We seek a revelation and knowledge that is so conclusive conclusive and finite that it would void all doubts and we should pursue a god like this but we should also learn from the story of the golden calf god is both knowable and incomprehensible at the same time there is a danger in parading a view of god that is limited to our previous context the cautionary tale of the golden calf is eerily similar to the religious system of the Pharisees and scribes that failed to acknowledge Jesus because he was unfamiliar to their expectations and experiences. The golden calf is less about avoiding the normal, nominal idols of sex and fast cars and money, and more about what happens when we settle for a familiar image of God and rob him of his glory and his disclosure and his revelation to his people. Patrick Miller, professor of Old Testament theology at Princeton, said, It is surely no accident that the Israelites' memory, the first act of covenantal disobedience on the part of the people, was the violation of the primary commandments when they made the golden calf. Surely for us, this will take great patience and humility. We can have quick-triggered entitlement. We, like the Israelites, seek physical, discernible images of spiritual presence, and we want it now. And when Moses failed to come back quickly, the Israelites resorted to an easy-bake oven image of Yahweh, even though his fiery presence loomed over the adjacent mountain. 
do you truly want to worship and follow a God that you could define and neatly pack in a box? And in that situation, who would actually be the God and who would be the creation? So in response to the golden calf, we, have to co- we commonly ask the question, what idols are in your life? And that's a great question for our lordship of Jesus. But I think a better question for this context might be, what are the images of God that you hold on to for the sake of your comfort and at the expense of his true glory? We need to read with great conviction and great humility at the same time. We need to pursue God with great eagerness and great patience at the same time. We will likely never see all of God at once, and that's why we need these stories. We need to read them, and we need to tell them to other people. We need the next generation to know them too, so that they might see the depths of God that we may have missed or skimmed over. So now Hannah is going to share. Hello, everyone. Um, Thank you, Tana. That was amazing. Um, It's so wonderful to get to be here with all of you. I'm a lot smaller in person. Some people have mentioned that, so I hope I don't disappoint. (laughs) Um, But doing a podcast is a largely solitary project, so I'm mostly sitting in my dorm room. I'm an RA, so I live with 28 freshmen, which is fun. Um, So it's me, my microphone, the screen, and Dave on the other side. So it's really nice to actually get to see you and your faces. And um, I, when I was speaking to Tanner about kind of my segment of today, I asked if I could just open up the floor and ask everyone, what are you learning from Thread so far? What are your hopes or concerns or the things you feel like God is teaching you through it? Um, And he said not to do that. So I hope that in the break I can have those conversations with you because I really do (laughs) want to, yeah, I want to hear your thoughts. Yeah, it's true. There are 300 people, so that would be a lot. Um, It was optimistic. Um, But when we started Thread last year um, and kind of began this journey through the Old Testament, um, it also coincided with me starting a class. Um, I'm studying theology. Um, in, and it, the class was called The Introduction to the Hebrew Bible. And so you'll notice that often, even in the podcast, I use the words like kind of Hebrew Bible and Old Testament kind of interchangeably. Um, and I think the reason for that is because I'm learning this kind of content in a religiously diverse space. So I'm in, sitting in the classrooms with Jews and atheists and every other faith um, in between. And the teacher explained that Old and New kind of Testament are a Christian framework. Um, where kind of new has this idea of superseding the old. And so in that sense, we kind of give more priority to the new and kind of lessen the value of the old, even with those terms. Um, And so that's why they call it the Hebrew Bible. Um, And I think actually being in a space where it's referred to as the Hebrew Bible has been a helpful reminder to me of its importance. And that the Old Testament and the Torah especially was the Bible of our New Testament heroes. And I love that James reminded us of that earlier. So when I think about Abraham, Jacob, Elijah, those were the heroes of Peter, James, and John. And when we're reading it, it's special to think that this was the text that they too were immersed in and put to memory and were shaped by. That's especially true of the Torah. Um, And I think James here spoke about the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, as it's called in Hebrew, as being divided into three main sections, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Um, And I think it's really interesting and significant that the opening of both the prophets and the writings, the the second two sections after the Torah, both point back to the Torah um, and point the reader back. um, Chapter 1 of Joshua, we see this instruction to him as a new leader to keep this book of the law, keep the Torah always on your lips, meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. And that's the very beginning of the prophets. And then the writings begin, Psalm 1. um, Blessed is the one whose delight is in the law, in that word Torah, and who meditates on his law day and night. And that word meditate, Hagar, is um, ponder, murmur, which kind of recite to yourself. Chew on, it's an active meditation. 
And I think the idea of meditating on the text, that alone really convicts me. I think we're in a digital age and culture um, and it doesn't, I think the culture we're in right now doesn't foster the kind of sitting with the text and that kind of deep memorization of the text that the original hearers would have been immersed in. We're kind of in the doom scrolling age. I don't know if you've heard that term where you just get caught in a loop of scrolling and if something doesn't grab your attention in the first two seconds, you're on to the next thing. Um, and we can't, I'm realizing I can't have that mindset when it comes to scripture and I have to kind of fight that desire for like stimulation or just instant appeal and I have to be able to sit and meditate on the text and I think that's a convicting challenge but I think it is the type of literature that rewards patience and when I think what are we meditating on Torah has been translated in our Bibles as the law as we see here um, and it's from the Greek word nomos and some scholars actually think a better translation would have been instruction I'm not a Hebrew expert like Phil, so he can correct me if I'm off. Um, but the Torah does consist of laws but, and commandments, but it's also narrative. And actually, much more of the Torah is narrative than laws. So it's story. And I think that's really interesting. What does it mean to meditate on story? And that's a question I want to return to. Um, I've been thinking a lot recently about transitions. Um, transitions from one generation to the next and I recently wrote an article reflecting on the nature of transitions within our own church um, which was inspired by many of our congregations around the world reaching a 40-year milestone I know it, 40 was reached in London and in Boston and elsewhere um, and many scholars consider 40 the length of a generation so there's 40 years in the wilderness for Israel. The first three kings of Israel, Saul, David, Solomon, they all ruled for 40 years, 40 days and nights. It's a number with great symbolism. So it's got me reflecting. And the Torah also is very concerned with transitions between generations and the importance of the next generation grasping the lessons, the history, the values of their forefathers. And so we see this call continually to talk about them when you're at home, um, on the road, going to bed. Um, and I believe it was of such importance to pass on because this was a people that were continually being uprooted. And there was a need for a narrative to anchor them. There's a, in that class I talked about, I read a commentary um, and there was a commentator called David Kleins who actually, for him, he said the theme of the Torah was homelessness. He described it as a people that lose their home and spend the rest of the narrative wandering in search of one. Now, I don't know if I'd say that was the entire theme, but I think it does speak to a uniqueness about the people that this literature was written by and for. And my teacher, he actually described the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament as a minority report. It becomes a majority report throughout history, and of course the Bible is the best-selling book of all time, but it begins as a minority report a text from marginalized people, for landless people, for wanderers. And from the time of Abraham, this is predicted when God first makes a covenant with him in Genesis 15, and he speaks over him while he's sleeping and says, know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not their own. And the very end of the Torah, as Moses is looking out a promised land that he himself doesn't get to enter, even then he knows that this people will not stay in it. And that cycle will continue again. Um, the Old Testament scholar, Walter Brueggemann, who me and Dave love, and we quote him a lot in the podcast, um, he describes the Torah as a script for a displaced community. And he talks about the Torah's importance for his people. I have a quote here. He says, This Torah is a normative act of imagination that serves to sustain and legitimate a distinct community of gratitude and obedience. That distinct community, whether in the Assyrian, Babylonian, or Persian period, lived among cultural pressures and political powers that had no appreciation of its distinctiveness. No, let me see, I've lost my... No doubt they found that distinctiveness at best an inconvenience, and if possible would have abolished it. Brueggemann talks about how the need to be reminded of their identity, especially for the Jewish people when they're in exile, and be reminded of their story would have been especially important for the young who did not have the same memories of Yahweh and his miracles as their parents would have had. And he writes, um, 
If the requirements of exile were costly and demanding for adults who went deep into memory and so sustained hope, we may imagine that the transmission to the next generation of this radical, buoyant distinctiveness was urgent and deeply problematic. The young, who did not after a while remember the ancient glories of Israel, were surely candidates for membership in the dominant culture of the empire at the expense of this distinctiveness. It's likely that the Torah is peculiarly aimed at the young in order to invite them into this distinct identity of wonder, gratitude, and obedience. It was an invitation to remember who and whose they were and to carry themselves with that identity and that knowledge of a different identity in a foreign land. When my nephew turned two, my sister started to teach him the Shema, which is the, the famous refrain, um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And of course, he has no idea what he's saying, but it's very moving to see a toddler already starting to internalize a story that's bigger than him, and we hope that it will stay with him. We see a real self-consciousness of the writer of the Torah um, to make sure the next generation know Yahweh and to know this other story that they're part of. And we see in Exodus 12, it's amazing actually, what, while they're preparing for the very first Passover, so they're being st instructed to smear blood of the lamb on their door frame so the angel of the Lord will pass over them. But already in that instruction, Moses is thinking ahead to what to say to the next generation when they ask about what this is. So he says many times, and I won't read all of these, but it's when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Tell them this. And in the next verse, on that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And the next verse is, in days to come when your son asks you, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And it's reiterated again in... Don't think that's one. But it's reiterated again in Deuteronomy, where it says, In the future, when your son asks you, What is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees, and laws that the Lord our God has commanded you? Tell him, We were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. And I like that with this kind of hypothetical child, there's enough space that it could be a curious child, it could be a skeptical child. But the response is the same. It's this clear message to impart to them that you're part of a bigger story. That we are a rebellious people, we're a blessed people, and we serve a holy, fierce, and loving God. Look what he did for us and our forefathers. Look where we started, where we went wrong, but look where we're going. Uh, before I began my studies in like theology, I was living in Moldova, was part of the Revive team, I, think, I don't know if Carlos is here, but he was also with me, um, that Revive Eastern Europe program that was led by the Wootens, and we were helping the church in Moldova, which is a neighboring country to Ukraine. We were situated very close to the border, and I'm sure many of you know what kind of happened there when the war broke out and everything changed. We kind of had this time frame of before the war and after the war, um, and I, my, some of my strongest memories from that time are of being in the lobby of the conference center where we lived. Um, and just waiting to welcome each van load of Ukrainians who had suddenly become refugees overnight. There were men, women, children, babies, and then there was a certain point where the law changed and men over the age of 18 could not leave, and then there were just women and babies, and, and we all lived together. And naturally, when they left, they were in a hurry, so they, they just grabbed whatever they could. And I remember after a few days, um, sitting with one of the mums, She's a sister in the church from Kiev. And she'd worn the same outfit a few days in a row, and maybe she was self-conscious, but she said, I don't normally look like this in my country. And it kind of caught me off guard. And then she said, come, let me show you. And then she pulled me onto the sofa and pulled up her Instagram page and began scrolling through. And first thing I noticed was she had thousands of followers, which I know that's not important, but I noticed it. And then we went through her photos, and there were these incredibly beautiful shots of her husband and sons who were back in Ukraine. I hadn't met them. The business they had, their home. And she said, this is me. This is where I'm from. And as I was thinking about the role of the Torah, this moment in Moldova with the sister actually came to mind. 
And of course, there was no technology back then, but if there was, I imagine like the elders of the families showing photos to their children in exile as they sit in these foreign lands in homes in Assyria, Babylon, Persia, like a family photo album showing them Eden, the fall, the rainbow, Egypt, Exodus, the Red Sea, the tabernacle, the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud, manna. This is who we are. This is where we're from. This is our God. And it's now 2024 and we all have our own stories. You have yours in Chicago. I have mine in London and Boston. And we have brothers and sisters in Eastern Europe that have their stories. But we're also a part of this story. This is our origin story and one we're called to meditate on. And I think the ability to hold these two stories, these kind of two identities in tension, I imagine it's what Jesus meant when he talked about his followers being in the world but not of this world. In Exodus 16, there's another instruction given with thought to the next generation. Oh, this is a little picture I drew of manna. Um, thanks, Tana, for the slides. Um, but after the people have been liberated from Egypt and they're being led um, by Moses through the Red Sea and they end up in this wilderness, God answers their cry of hunger with bread from heaven. And it's a substance that tasted like wafers and honey. And the Bible tells us it's called manna, which in Hebrew literally means, what is it? (laughs) It had never been seen or tasted before and was an entirely unexpected answer to the Israelites' cry for hunger. And it rained down at God's command and sustained Israel for 40 years for the length of a generation. And in Exodus 16 and verse 32, we see God command Moses, take some of the manna, put it in a jar and preserve it because he wanted the next generation to see it. And it says he wanted later generations to see the food I gave you in the wilderness when I set you free. And it was meant to be a tangible and powerful way that he desired the generations to come to gain faith in his provision by being shown this miracle that had been done in their generation, one that was unexpected and it was never repeated. And on the episode we did on story, uh, we spoke about how in addition to this larger story that we're in, our faith communities have their own stories. Our churches have their own stories. And I believe our fellowship of churches has its own miracle stories, astonishing ways of God providing, opening doors for the gospel, transforming lives and entire nations. And as someone growing up in the church in London, um, I grew up on these stories. And I certainly believe these stories are meant to be shared. I think a danger I see comes when we can make those stories a formula. When we point to them and say, this is how God works because we've seen it done before. This is how God works, so this is how God will work for you. And I think when we do this, it's almost as if it's no longer the miracle that's being held up in a jar, but God himself, the God that temples can't, couldn't contain. And when such stories are shared as prescriptive, it puts a pressure on the next generation to repeat what has been done before in the hope of similar results. And Tana spoke about this, but I think we can have a comfort in formula, in metrics and verifiable outcomes. And I think that's our Western post-enlightenment way of thinking, where we love certainty. We love to feel like, as Tana said, we've mastered something. And that can lead us to approach the Bible almost scientifically. And I think it's intriguing and even maybe amusing that God chose narrative to be the dominant genre, not just of the Torah, but of scripture which utterly resists this methodology. It's more art than science, which means a willingness to be comfortable with mystery. Mystery when it comes to who God is and how he works in his world. And I'm convicted by the way Jesus, as was shared, will later rebuke the Pharisees and the teachers of the law for the way they held on to their interpretations with a tight fist. I don't think that's what was meant by meditating on the law, meditating on the story because they managed to miss the living, breathing God who was right in front of them. And that's a scary thought, and may that never be said of us. The thread throughout the Torah is him. And I think that's why the Torah and really the whole Bible has no issue, including the stories of very flawed characters, because it's not about them, but rather the God who is continually working in spite of them and through them and for them. I mentioned at the start that the commentator, um, David Klein, said the theme of the Torah was homelessness. 
I think the theme of the Torah is God's faithfulness to a people who are continually being taught to find their roots, not in a place, but in him. And we're not in exile in exactly the same way as they were, but in other ways we are. And we too face the same pressures to assimilate the dominant culture around us as they did. I know I feel that. But by delighting in the Torah, meditating on it, I think it can be just as much a reminder for us too of this greater story that we're a part of. A story with many twists and turns, but we can take comfort in the fact that we know the love and faithfulness of the author. So I'm going to end there. (laughs) Were we able to grasp all of that? There was a lot of ooing and like, oh, oh. I was, uh, there were points when Tanner was speaking that he, they both spoke with such a tone of joy, and yet I felt like I was just getting killed. I'm like, I think they're liking this a little too much, you know what I mean? I think the idea of, of fashioning God into something that makes sense to me, but doesn't capture God or doesn't allow God to be captured more broadly, is really convicting. And anybody who's ever reached out to a family member and brought them to church on the attraction to the church being something humanistic versus God, we understand that. And if you've had a visitor sometime in your life and you brought that person and something about the human construct of what was happening that day was a little awkward or off and you're like, oh no, they're not going to like our church. Uh, we prob- we're all nodding, so I think, or the sermon wasn't what you'd hoped it'd be. That probably never happened, but anyway. Um, <laughs> The point being is that we can get so lost in this whole thing on who it is we're trying to glorify and what we're trying to get people to see. It's not us, it's God and prayerfully God in us and amongst us. Um, the, and I appreciated Tanner drawing that out. I think when Hannah, when she said that the Torah is being distinctly aimed at the young, I literally, it was like, oh! I've never had that thought in my mind. And I have to say to have a couple of young 30-somethings up here with the intelligence and the things they're presenting, I was like, it's so moving to see that demonstration of God through them today. And I think for us older disciples, a lot of times when you're trying to build a church, you're trying to use mechanisms that are more shallow to attract the young. When in fact, what we're hearing today and what Hannah demonstrated today in her, both that quote and that idea, and then those Exodus passages about when the young people ask you, say this, is that we need to demonstrate a deeply mature spirituality and young people will be attracted to God through that. And so I think we have to be careful of all the bells and whistles we may think bring impact when in fact it's us loving God and being filled with God and and people seeing the obviousness of that despite who we are anyway I don't want to redo the lesson I'm just sitting here as an older disciple going that was crazy so that maybe is the best way to take a break that was crazy let's take a break in that craziness and we'll be back together for the last session
first hour. All right, everybody, we're going to get started. Uh, we're going to come back with a song. I want to encourage us, come on back. Let's just stand up for one moment in our seats. We're going to sing to God uh, and, and get ready to continue with our, our time today. Thank you, Lord, for loving me, and thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole, saving my soul. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. I want to thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Please, please reveal your will for me so I can serve for eternity. Use my life in every way, hold of it today. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. I want to thank you, Lord, for saving my... I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. I want to thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Okay, uh, we are into our last session of the day. Do we have more room in our minds and in our hearts? I hope so, because uh, the author of our encounter book, Joel Nagel, is going to kick us off. And, uh, and then Winston Bettino, a beloved region leader here and a longstanding member of the Chicago Church, will close us out today. Hey, at least one person was clapping for you, Winston. That's good. So they're going to be talking about the joy of the Torah. So we'll turn it over to our brother, Joel Nagel. Amen. Uh, go green! Go white! All right, I love that. <laughs> That's perfect. I've got a screensaver up on this screen. If that could go away, that would be awesome. Because um, I can't see what's going on. But... Uh, so we're going to talk about finding joy in the Torah. There it is. Excellent. It's so good to see all of you, and uh, I'm so excited uh, to be with you this morning. This is our last hour, and so we need some joy in this last hour. Amen? Hopefully you've found some joy already, but in case you haven't, here we go. Um, there is, uh, my slides are pretty in-depth, and so if you want to follow along on your phone, you can do that if you take uh, snap the QR code here, or you can have that to take with you later and to study more deeply. Also, I wanted it to seem like everyone was taking my picture for a moment, and so <laughs> this is perfect. This is great. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to end this teaching day with kind of a deep dive into something that you might not expect from the Torah, especially if you've tried to read the Bible from cover to cover, and you got stuck at the end of Levitic, or end of Exodus, the middle of Leviticus. Maybe you even made it into Numbers, but then you gave up and decided to jump to the New Testament. And that thing that we're going to discover in an unlikely place is joy. Winston is going to follow up my portion by highlighting some joyful applications of the Torah. What I want to talk about is a joy-filled calendar. The connection to joy might not seem obvious when you get into the really intricate details in some of these accounts. And I think it's so important for us as we read anything in the Bible, but maybe the more, like, le the less joy you're feeling, maybe it's even more important to to do this, to imagine yourself in that place. And so we're going to spend time in Leviticus chapter 23. You can turn there, leave your Bible next to you if you want to. 
Uh, but the holy days and the festivals and the times of rest that we'll soon discover, these would have been, these would have been like the highlights of the year for Hebrew families. There was fasting and feasting, singing and ceremony, road trips, retreats. Um, I know for, for me, and maybe you feel this too, calendars don't always bring us joy. Um, you know, my wife and I, we were looking at the calendar for April, and it was discouraging. Uh, we, have, we have two girls, 16 and 12, and we're so busy, they're so busy, and, and so it's not always encouraging to look ahead at the calendar. Like, almost, almost don't want to have that conversation, knowing what I've got on my calendar. But today, looking at God's calendar is going to be so encouraging. Amen? Amen. Amen. Have you ever thought about that? God's calendar. What's on God's calendar? Interestingly, it's actually mentioned on the very first page of Scripture and many times throughout Torah. And you can kind of refer to these in the background. I won't read all of them. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14, we see that the sun, the moon, the stars, they weren't just made to provide light, but they were made to mark seasons and special days and years. And so when we look at God's calendar, this is what this means, we're actually looking at something that's bigger than the Bible. It's connected to creation itself, the days, the years that we're going to read about. It's definitely even bigger than Israel's calendar. This is a cosmic calendar that we're going to look at. And as we'll soon see, these special days and years, they're very important. God takes his calendar very seriously. I've always found it amazing, that second passage there in Exodus chapter 12. Before Israel is even out of Egypt, God is telling them how important it is to commemorate their trip out of Egypt and to have a Passover celebration each year. Uh, it's been mentioned a few times that the, the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, is, is in a different order than our Bible. And so if you read the Tanakh, the very end of the Bible, you know, our Bible ends with Malachi and this hope that we'll, you know, the, the righteousness of God will come, we'll leap like calves. The Hebrew Bible ends with the end of Second Chronicles. And so this is the last chapter of the Hebrew Bible. They burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire and destroyed all its precious vessels. He took into exile in Babylon those who had escaped from the sword and they became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had made up for its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. God takes the days of celebration, rest, joy, very seriously. We learn here that one of the reasons that Israel had to go into captivity was because they didn't celebrate the Sabbath days and Sabbath years that were mandated in the Torah. God takes joy and rest so seriously that he's willing to end the Bible with this. Of course, we know that he had a greater joy planned. Joy is commanded. Joy and command, those don't really feel like they go together, do they? But I think that God, if you know yourself, if you know the way that our world works, I think God had to command it. It's in our nature to downplay joy and celebration and rest. And this isn't God just saying, like, get happy or don't be sad. This is like a deep down rhythmic joy and rest that marks your life. That's what God is commanding and desiring and instructing in Torah. In three places in the Torah, God's calendar is laid out. Three times we see the calendar in these dates. As we, as we read in Genesis 1, there are the seasons days and years that are that are supposed to be special for God and his people and so we see these in the rhythms of Sabbath days each week and and Sabbath years every seventh year and then a jubilee 
after every 49th year or seven times seven years. We've got some Bible math going on here. And then also there are seven holy days and festivals, which we're going to get a crash course on in a moment. We're not going to get into this, but it really it needs to be mentioned that the overall rhythm of life was dictated by Sabbath which is mentioned at the end of the beautifully intricate Genesis 1 creation song. You know, Hannah talked about the poetry in the Bible, the songs in the Bible. Um, the, the Bible begins with a song, singing creation to us. C.S. Lewis picked up on that in The Magician's Nephew in the Chronicles of Narnia. There's a thread that you can follow through Scripture through the life of Jesus where he, proclaim, he ends up proclaiming to be the Lord of the Sabbath. And then through the end of time, when we'll rest in God's presence. Sabbath rest is actually what we were created into. We were created on the sixth day. So our first day, our first full day, was a day of rest. I think one, one thing that's important to note here is that we still need real rest in our lives. We need that ceasing rest that is Sabbath. Jesus didn't kill Sabbath. He fulfilled it. And we should find rest in him. We're robbing ourselves of joy if we don't. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, Leviticus chapter 23. So now that we've kind of briefly touched on the rhythm of God's calendar, I want to look at these specific dates. There are seven festivals. Four in the spring. Passover, unleavened bread, and first fruits, which likely all took place the same weekend. And then 50 days later, the Feast of Weeks, or Pentecost. And then there were three festivals in the fall, trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and tabernacles. And since it's kind of starting to feel like spring today, we'll start in the spring. And also the Jewish year began not in the middle of winter. Why do we do that? It began in the spring. It kind of makes more sense. Amen? Um, and so let's talk about, for a second, Passover. Passover is the commemoration of the angel of death passing over the firstborn sons of Israel, but not passing over the firstborn of Egypt. The Israelites painted lamb's blood on the, on the doors and lentils of their homes. This ultimately led to their freedom from slavery. Unleavened bread, uh, the day after Passover, was the, uh, was the beginning of this feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread that would last for seven days. So yeast was a good thing, but it could also get out of control. And so they had a festival where every year they rid their houses of all of the yeast so there wouldn't be an outbreak. This week-long festival um, made sure that there wouldn't be an outbreak, but it also commemorated their swift flight out of Egypt. The Israelites had no time to let the dough rise, and so they took unleavened bread with them when Pharaoh finally let the people go. The next holy day is first fruits, and this was a holy Sunday when Israel would bring in the very first sheaves of winter barley. That's the first crop that would grow in Israel. They would faithfully give their very first grains from their harvest, counting on God to provide more. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 23, and, the, and also in, uh, in, according to Flavius Josephus, who's a first century historian for the Jews, he wrote the Antiquities of the Jews, he mentioned Jesus twice, mentioned John the Baptist. There, these three first holy days were celebrated on the 14th, 15th and 16th of the first month of the Jewish year on a Friday, a Saturday, and a Sunday. And there's debate about the specifics of the days. We won't get into the weeds with it, uh, and there are a lot of weeds with this. But you can imagine that these first three festivals were like a holy weekend, which should be easy for us to imagine because we just had a holy weekend last weekend, right? And there's going to be some connections in a moment. So those are the first three in the spring. And then the fourth one, 50 days later, is the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost. And so again, Bible math, seven weeks, that's 49 days, would be counted off from the Sunday of first fruits. And that next Sunday, the 50th day, that's what Pentecost means, 50th, 
uh, in Greek, that would be a similar s- celebration to first fruits, but instead of barley, they celebrated the coming of the winter wheat that took 50 more days to grow. Okay, so those are the spring festivals and ho- holy days. Let's skip to the fall. Up first in the fall is this Feast of Trumpets. This would be like the Woodstock. I appreciate Tanner mentioning Woodstock um, and Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. We've got to keep Neil Young in there. Um, that's good stuff. Uh, but this is, like, this is like this music festival. These horns uh, would, be, would be played. Uh, trumpets are in the Bible a lot. They appear as warnings of war, instruments for celebration, the shofar or that ram's horn trumpet was blown before every Sabbath night from the southwest corner of the temple when three stars became visible. This would alert people that it was a new day and that it was Sabbath. Um, I should say that Hebrew days began in the evening um, and went from evening to evening. Just like Genesis 1 says, there was evening and there was morning on the first day, evening and morning on each day. That's how they did their days. Their days, start again, started with rest. Okay? And so Sabbath started on what we would consider Friday night when there were three stars visible from this corner of the temple when the ram's horn was blown. There's actually a week of thread devotionals coming up for you guys where you kind of experience that there's evening devotionals and morning devotionals. The next festival in the fall was the Day of Atonement. This was the one day that the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies, and it was a day that one goat was sacrificed for the sins of the people, and another goat was freed with the people's sins symbolically on its back, taking the sins of the people out of sight. This came to be called the scapegoat, if you've ever wondered where that word came from. You can read more about that in Leviticus 16. The last feast in the fall is the Feast of Tabernacles. And this would have absolutely been my favorite feast. It was like a week-long national campout. Uh, they made booths or tents. They slept under the stars to commemorate their time in the wilderness with Moses. This was the full harvest festival, not the first fruits. This was after everything was brought in. They could be so grateful for what God had brought for them. It was also the beginning of the dry season, And Jerusalem was on the edge of the desert, and so there'd be ceremonies and prayers for water at this time. Okay, so I hope that this helps you envision these joyous moments from Old Testament life. When you guys did the Songs of Ascent in the Encounter book, you could could imagine families from all over going to Jerusalem for these festivals. But here's where this gets, like, really amazing. As I said at the beginning, these festivals and holy days, they're not just Hebrew holidays. They're baked into creation. They're on God's cosmic calendar. And so let's revisit the spring holy days, but with a broader view. When we look at the New Testament, we see that these festivals are at the center of major moments in the life of Jesus and the church. Jesus' death on the cross, the first Good Friday, which we just celebrated, fell on the preparation and feast of Passover. The Lamb of God's blood was painted on the wooden posts of the cross, but God did not spare his firstborn and only son. God made it happen on this symbolic day. Saturday, likely the day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, Jesus' body did not rise from the dead. Instead, he kills sin and its corruption with his own death. And then we just celebrated Easter Sunday. This is the day that Christ, the first fruits, rose from the dead. And we don't just celebrate his resurrection on Easter Sunday, do we? He's the first fruit of a greater harvest that we're counting on. We look forward to a resurrection like his for all who believe. Paul says that the Spirit even joins with us and that all of creation is groaning for that day. We can be so faithful and joyful 
as we wait because God has given us the example of Jesus as the first fruit of the resurrection to come. Amen? And then lastly for the spring, 50 days later, on the day of Pentecost, the church began. The apostles spent 40 days with the resurrected Jesus And then 10 days huddled in the upper room praying. And then imbibed with the Holy Spirit, Peter and the apostles preached the full gospel for the first time. The early wheat harvest of that day was 3,000. But how many thousands upon thousands more have responded to the gospel since that day? In many ways, we're still living in that day on God's calendar in the church age. That's pretty cool. I love seeing how God's spring calendar coincided with Jesus and the church. But here's where it gets even more interesting. Let's end by looking at the fall holy days one more time. So we saw what was in many ways the fulfillment of the spring festivals in Jesus and the church. These last three festivals all point to the parousia, the promised return of Jesus, the Son of God. First comes the Feast of Trumpets. I want to read these passages here. For the Lord himself, with a cry of command, with the archangel's call, and with the sound of God's trumpet, will descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Look, I'll tell you a mystery. We will not all die, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will all be changed. The trumpet blast, signifying a new day on God's calendar, is associated with Jesus' return. And I went to Israel a few years ago, and in Israel, in the Israel Museum, they have this stone. Um, when the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, just like Jesus prophesied, not one stone was left on another. That's utter destruction. And, and I've read that before, and I've wondered, you know, even the, even the Second Chronicles scripture we started with, how do you set a, temp, a stone temple on fire? How does that work? Well, one of the reasons that the temple's destruction was so devastating for Jews and Christians was because of the nature of the limestone that it was built with. Limestone has air pockets in it, and when it gets superheated, like when you light it on fire, those huge blocks explode. Israel didn't just lose their their place of worship. They watched it explode. The only piece that they found from from that that's intact with writing on it was found in 1968, and it says this, the trumpeting place. The only decipherable piece of the temple left is this corner where the priest would blow the trumpet for the Sabbath and for this festival, which happens to be the next day on God's cosmic calendar. Pretty amazing, huh? The next festival day, excuse me, is the Day of Atonement. This was the holiest day, the day when all sin was dealt with. One goat received the penalty of death, and one was set free and led out of sight. Jesus will make it so that all sin is dealt with forever, and we truly get to be at one with God when he returns. Scripture often refers to this day as the the day with a capital D. And then last in the fall is the Feast of Tabernacles. Jesus in his life went to the Feast of Tabernacles in John chapter 7. It's actually an amazing read in John chapter 7 with this background. And he declared that rivers of living water would flow from all believers. Which is like, why is he? He stands up and, and says, living, rivers of living water will flow from all believers. It's like strange. It doesn't make sense. But he said this during the water ceremony on the last day called the great day. On the last day called the great day. 
This is echoed at the very end of Revelation, which features a flowing river and the thirsty are invited to drink. This is the full harvest festival. Everything that God has sown will be reaped and brought in for harvest. They built tents to commemorate wilderness wandering and they ate inside them for seven days. We will wander no more. We will have the most permanent dwelling place, a seat at the kingdom feast with God for eternity. There's a lot more to this, uh, but we're limited on time, and I'm grateful that Winston gave me a, a few extra minutes. And you have this slideshow. You can go back and read the scriptures and make your own connections. There's much, much more. But I do want to end with a few applications for us. Um, all of this goes like beyond head knowledge. Seeing the joy that God has in store for us can change the way that we walk with Jesus and with one another. And so consider this. Joy, feasts, commemoration, restfulness, these are things that are on the, the first and last pages of the Bible and so many places in between. God wants us to have a great experience in this life. I love that. And then what magnifies these festivals is that they're based on seasons of harvest and even on the water cycle. This isn't just a thing in Leviticus chapter 23. These themes of celebration are baked into the creation of the world itself, like the tilt of the earth and the weather, weather patterns and how long it takes seeds to grow, the way that God made things. God's timing for Jesus, the church, and the second coming is not random. He's keeping a cosmic calendar. Even Jesus understood this, and he said he didn't know the times or dates, but the Father does. It's like God really is keeping a calendar. Now, i got to say this. With the eclipse coming up, and if you've, if, I've already seen crazy videos out there, okay, about Jesus coming back during the eclipse. Um, this, with God's calendar, this doesn't mean that we should try to figure out God's calendar with wacky theories, okay? That's not the application. Even Jesus didn't know and didn't try to know. We can just wonder at the mystery. We can ponder and stand in awe of God, amen? Looking at these festivals, though, does, does this, and I hope it does this for you as well. It should give us so much faith that Jesus really is coming back and that we will rise with him. Four of the seven festivals have been fulfilled. We're over halfway there. I just wonder how mind-blowing the fulfillment of the fall festivals is going to be. And then here's another application. You know, there's a lot we don't know and can't be certain of. I tried to make caveats where necessary about the exact dates and all of that. But this kind of exercise where you start in one place and go through Scripture and then beyond Scripture and into our lives today and into the future, you can do this with all kinds of things. And I think it can give us some joy when we read the Torah if, we, if instead of like skipping over these things, we, we actually go deeper into them. Um, and so you can do this with the threads of the sacrifices, the purity laws, the other laws, the tabernacle, the priesthood, and more. It's all threaded throughout Scripture and creation. It all speaks to our past, our present, and our forever. We should do a podcast about it where we find our place in God's story. Doesn't that sound awesome? <laughs> but you can study that on your own too, amen? And lastly, this is what I want to say. This is what I want to leave, leave us with here. If you're a Christian, it's summertime all the time. We saw that the spring was fulfilled in the New Testament. We're waiting for the fall. It's summertime. The summer was a time for farming, for working the fields, for making sure that the harvest would be as robust as possible, feeding and watering those plants. And so sit with this question. What does it mean for us to be God's people in the summer, waiting for what's next in the fall? I know that in many ways we're still waiting for the spring in the Midwest. Maybe it's here today. But let's live in the summer months of God's calendar 
full of joy. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Joel, so much for that. You know, I was sitting there and I was just thinking, man, we should have asked Joel before to come before we actually read the Encounter book. Because when I was reading the Encounter book, I did not picture Joel as joy. I was picturing him something else, but not joy in that Encounter book. I'm like, man, I should have heard Joel speak before that. But anyway, and then uh, I saw something today I've never seen before at church. When Hannah, I'm not sure if Hannah is still here, but when Hannah came up, literally there were so many people took out their phone and took pictures. Like none of you are taking pictures of me right now. What is wrong with this picture? I mean, it was just like, what is happening? I have never seen that before at church. People were taking pictures. That was, anyway. Well, I have an easy job today as I close out. We're actually, I'm doing application of the Torah. So we're gonna call this Torah Applied, okay? So what do you, there's so many things that we've learned today from all the presenters this morning, but really my job today is really like, what can you take away from this? Maybe a couple things that would, something that you can apply right away into our lives as disciples. So I'm gonna call it Torah Applied. As you have already heard today, the Torah teaches that the five books of Moses uh, James even mentioned this contains 613 commandments. Now, we're not going to look at all 613, but I'm going to give you a taste of some of those commandments today. That number consists of 248 positive commandments and 365 negative commandments. In other words, there are 248 that is action-oriented, things to do, and there are uh, 365 things that we should not do. Commandments that we should not do or the Jewish people should not do. The main message of the Torah is that the Jewish people are a people set apart from other cultures. So upholding these commandments, upholding these laws, distinguishes them from the rest of the culture. That's how they took it. That's why this is so important to them. So of all of these things, like what I said, you know, some scholars says that out of the 248 positive commandments, only 126 of them are still applicable today. So some of them are not even applicable to, to, uh, to the Jewish people today or to us today. And of the 365 negative commandments, only 243 are still applicable. So in total nowadays, 369 out of 613 can be applied or observed. Now, even among the 369 commandments, some of them, like I, like I said, some of them really, it's not applicable or situational in nature. I'll give you an example. In Deuteronomy 22, in verse eight and nine, the Bible says, when you build a new house, then you shall make a railing for your roof, that you might not bring guilt or bloodshed on your household if anyone falls from it. Now, I have not seen a roof yet with railing. It's just not common in Chicago, right? I mean, it's not how we build our houses nowadays. But back then, when you see those pictures, they have those. As a matter of fact, the story of David when David sinned, where was he? On that roof. They had railings. They have fences all around the roof before. And I love this commandment. So that if somebody falls, you're not guilty of it. Well, you fell. Well, they, there was a gate. That's your fault. You fell. <laughs> That's right. I mean, I love that. I'm like, okay, I could take this. I could get this. This is pretty cool. Um, but some of the basic behavior uh, principles from the Torah that, again, even though it was written for a group of people, you could still see as I talk about this today, it really applies to us still. Number one, good works. Always be on the lookout for opportunities to do good things for others and for yourself. Get up on the right side of the bed, be nice, and always be the one who does the right thing. That's a principle in the Torah that you and I can still take away from and apply into our lives today. 
act of kindness. Look at the world through the eyes of compassion. Empathize with the challenges of others and look eagerly for opportunities to be kind for everyone, especially to those less fortunate than you are. Hospitality. I'm going to skip that because something that I'm actually going to talk a lot about today is hospitality. Charity is another one. Give generously to charities and to individuals who are in need. Make it a regular habit. Visiting the sick. Visit and or call people you know who are ill and be sensitive to their needs. Know that visiting a sick person is part of their healing process and makes a big difference. Evil speech. Be careful with what you say. Don't be verbally abusive. Don't embarrass someone publicly. Don't lie. I know that words can be cruel weapons. Those are basic principles that even though, like what I said, it was written back then, it really does apply to us today. Amen? Uh, I already talked about that, so I'm going to move on. So here's some of the example of the positive teachings of the Torah. Relating to God, know that God exists. Again, we know that. That applies to us, Exodus 22. Love God. Strive to imitate God's good and upright ways. When it comes to prayers, worship God with prayer, right? Uh, say the Shema affirmation of God's unity in the morning and at night. Another one here is a love and human relations. Rebuke the sinner, but don't be self-righteous about it. If you see your neighbor carrying something, help him with his load. The poor and unfortunate, leave an, an, an unripped corner of your field or orchard to the poor. Leave the leftover crops that have not been gathered for the poor. Give charity according to your means. Those are the positive teachings of the Torahs. Negative ones relating to God. Don't entertain the idea that there's any other God but eternal God. Don't curse God. Don't test God's word. Love and human relations. Don't stay on the sidelines when life is in danger. Which means if you see somebody in danger, you're supposed to come in and help out. Don't hurt or damage anyone with your speech. We talk about that a little bit here. Don't let resentment eat away at your heart. In terms of food, don't eat meat from unclean animals. Don't eat winged insects. I don't either, but hey, maybe some of you do. Don't slaughter an animal and its young on the same day. That's interesting. In other words, have some sensitivity to the circle of life. They, have, they talk about courts and court procedures. Do not help a guilty person by being malicious witness. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you give testimony in a lawsuit, do not pervert justice by siding with a crowd. And do not show favoritism to a poor person in a lawsuit. If you actually dig in and really dive into the teachings and the commandments, all of this, it makes sense. And again, it still applies to us today. So when people question, like, should we really follow the Torah? Again, there are some that are situational, that doesn't quite apply. But majority of them still pretty much apply to us today. I'm going to focus on a couple things. I really like to focus on hospitality. I think it's one of a great strength of us as disciples. Honestly, it's one of the great strengths of uh, our fellowship of churches. We love hospitality. I'm Filipino. I love food. Okay? And I know I think a lot of you do too, if I'm not mistaken. So hospitality, or inviting guests, is an important commandment that every Jewish person and family must make every effort to fulfill. In Deuteronomy 10, 19, the Bible says, You shall love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. It's a great reminder for them, okay, that they are also strangers. And there's a great story, obviously, of Abraham and Sarah, and they're known for being such a hospitable couple, okay? And again, you could read that story more in your own time. 
Hospitality. The Torah teaches the following details regarding hospitality. Check this out. I love this. Seek out guests. Don't just wait for people to show up. I expect invitations after I speak today from some of you. Make your guests feel wanted. Make sure your guests feel comfortable about their need for food, drink, and washing facilities. When guests arrive, give them time to relax and rest it after their journey to see you. So don't just keep talking when they get one in the door. Let them sit down, chill for a little bit, maybe a nice iced tea or something, you know, coffee. Let, give them some time to rest. Make sure your guests don't feel like they're in imposition. Treat guests royally. Tend to your guests' need as quickly as possible. I mean, these are some great, you know, when we think of hospitality, sometimes we don't really think that way, right? Again, I, I, we're all busy people, right? So sometimes the best thing you could do is get chicken wings from Jewel. I mean, that's the best thing sometimes that you can do, okay? And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. But what I'm showing to you right now is that, man, it took a lot of effort to really treat guests, to really show hospitality. And I hope that we could really embody that as a, as a church. Amen? Now, this one is fun. How many of you are engaged right now? Nobody? Man, if I read this before, I mean, I don't know why I didn't read this before. I would have decided to do a, a GoFundMe account because I wanted to take a year off, right? Here's a teaching. An unusual set of commandments in the Torah pertains to a newly married couple. The Torah teaches that a newly married husband shall be free for one year to rejoice with his wife. Deuteronomy 24.5, I'm not joking here. It says, if a man has recently married, he must not be sent to war or have any other duty laid on him. For one year, he is to be free to stay at home and bring happiness to the wife he has married. I love the Torah. This is awesome. If I could change something, I would change the recently married. I would just take the word recently and just say married. <laughs> but anyway, I'm not the writer of this one. Here we go. We're almost done. Here's about helping others. Again, I'm just giving you guys, I'm, I, this is not my teaching. I'm showing you some of the commandments. And honestly, when you see them, like, man, I could apply this to my life. This is really good for me to hear. Several times in the Torah, God commands people not to stand idly by, by, by while someone is in need. The Torah's answer to the question, am I my brother's keeper, is yes. In fact, there's a special commandment concerning your responsibility to try to correct the ways of others around you. Leviticus 19.17 says, Do not nurse hatred in your heart for any, of your, for any of your relatives. Confront people directly so you will not be held guilty for their sin. And this applies to our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we can't just say, well, that's their problem. That's their sin. Okay? Because the Torah is not just a teaching for individuals. It was a teaching as a community together. How to live together in a community. Another one. Other verses. If you see that a donkey of someone who, hate, who hates you has collapsed under its load, do not walk by. Instead, stop and help. Do not spread slanderous gossip among your people. Do not stand idly by, by when your neighbor's life is threatened. I am the Lord. Leviticus 19, 16. If you see that your neighbor's donkey or ox has, has collapsed on the road, do not look the other way. Go and help your neighbor get it back on its feet. The Bible, God, in terms of community, I mean, the first word here, I'm not sure if you guys notice it, no, don't notice it. He says, someone who hates you. You guys have issues together. There's a conflict. But the Bible says, hey, if you see its donkey collapse, you actually go and help out. You just don't, 
just because you guys have issues, the Bible doesn't permit us just to look the other way. Amen? There's so many things, I, for the sake of time, it is 1255, there's so many things we can learn. Again, there's 613 commandments. And sometimes when we think of that, it's like, oh, it applies in the Old Testament. But the truth is, what I want us to do today as we close out is to know that it applies to all of us. These are principles to live by individually and as a community, as a church. Amen? Hopefully this has been a great day for you, helpful day. Thank you so much for being here and listening. I'm going to leave it to Baron Goche. Okay, are you full yet? Wow. Um, many of us have known Phil Lasarsky and James Becknell and, and uh, Winston for many years. They've been here for many years. Tanner, not as long, but has been here for quite a while. And we've spent time with them and I know I've had many interactions with them in many different ways, many different situations, but to hear them in this setting is, it, my respect for them that is already there is taken to a whole nother level. And to allow them to influence the way we see God, I think is just a precious thing that we are grateful to have here in Chicago, amen. For those individuals, thank you very much for what you've done now for our, amen. For our newest relationships, not all of them are new, because Dr. Dave Pachta, who did not teach today, but is present here today, amen. Dave has a lot of history here in Chicago, but then Joel Nagel, who I've known for many years, had a relationship with Joel, but then the newest of us, the one that everybody was taking pictures of, Hannah D'Souza, <laughs> amen? For those people, just so you know, when we spent a year as an eldership and leadership considering what we were going to be doing in the Chicago church going forward for the next three to five years, when these were the names discussed and the people we were talking to, we understood that they were going to have an influence over the church that we all shepherd. And as we continue that relationship and talking about those things and making those decisions, we are so grateful that these people, as you heard them today, we're grateful that these are the people God blessed us with and we chose to help influence the church, amen? Let's, let's thank them all for what they are doing for us. Amen. I must admit, when we first started Torah, I thought I was somewhat excited about it, but I thought, how is the Torah going to impact my little personal life? Because I'm just one little guy here in the church. But as I listened to them, and especially James, as, he's, as he began and Phil, as they began, I thought, as they walked through the generations and millennia of the whole cycle, the story of this beautiful existence, then a couple of challenges, then the law, then the rebellion, and then the rescue story that God has played out over millennia, I thought, well, that actually plays out in my life over a week at a time. And then when you really look at it, like sometimes all in one day. So when I look at it that way, not only is the Torah so important to my life, I see my story in it. I can relate to it and I can see how God comes to the rescue and how I just have to hang on to him in those moments when I want to put him in this box that is comfortable for me. So thank you guys, all of you that taught, for expanding my image of God today in a very, very powerful way. And I want to, amen. And I want to thank you guys, because as I was talking to some of those that were teaching today, you are the, you are the hardcore ones. 
You're the ones that want this. You desire this. You are pursuing this. And that's what God is pleased with. Amen. Amen. So let's celebrate ourselves. As Winston said, let's be hospitable with one another today. Let's share some joy together. Amen. 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 Let us pray. And then we will be dismissed for some time of fellowship. Father, man, you are bigger than we ever thought. You are, though we know you in an adequate way where we can, our souls are saved. But Father, there is so much we don't know about you that we desire to know about you. I thank you for these men and women who were here that you have prepared and trained and they have given themselves to your word and the study of it so that they could bring this to us today. And Father, we thank you that we can come together and learn about you. And then as we leave this place, we can share even more with others about your awesomeness. So Father, thank you for blessing us with you today. We can never have enough of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. For those of you that have kids, go and get those kids. They're probably missing you right now. Thank you guys very much.